I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 is our text today. Uh, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, walking through it chapter by chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,123, and you will find our text for the day. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, then please feel free to take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, i got to confess that I'm a little bit uh, hesitant today uh, on the message because I know that as I preach that I'm going to offend some people. Uh, I'm probably going to confuse some people. Uh, I'll probably delight some people too uh, because we're talking about a subject that's been controversial for, oh, I don't know, 1,600 years. Okay? For about the past 1,600 years, people who love Jesus, who believe in the Bible as God's Word, who want to serve God with their whole lives, have been arguing about God's sovereignty and election. Okay, that's just reality. If you grew up in church and you heard this talked about, you were uh, taught or, or encouraged to believe a particular uh, way. And, and Christianity has been divided over this issue for a long, long time. And, and you can go back and read those arguments and read all about that. But uh, we're going to be talking about it today. And at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And so we're going to uh, read it, we're going to study it, we're going to preach it, and we want everyone to be challenged by what Scripture says, even when you don't like it or when you're uncomfortable with it. Uh, that's the whole thing. We're supposed to conform our lives to the Bible, not the other way around. And, and uh, when you preach through books of the Bible, like we're doing with Romans, then you can't avoid some passages. You can't avoid some texts. So I honestly will tell you, uh, growing up in church every you know, week I was there, never heard anyone preach on this text, on this passage. Uh, and so uh, this, is, this is kind of like uh, territory that a lot of people just choose not to go. Uh, and at Calvary, we have five essential doctrines. If you want to know what those are, you can uh, either pick up a brochure at the Connection Center or you can go on our, our website at calvarylhc.com and see them there. Or you can uh, take one of our intro classes. I think we have one next Saturday. And, and, uh, and I just want you to know that what I'm teaching about today is not one of those five essential doctrines. And so uh, as I teach this, I'm going to share with you my biblical convictions. It's not what I was taught growing up. It's not how I was raised to believe. It's the place I've come to uh, as I've studied Scripture, and, and uh, this is where I'm comfortable placing my faith and my understanding of the subject. But I have no compulsion that you need to agree with me. Okay, I'm just telling you that right up front. I, I, it doesn't matter to me if you agree with me, if you disagree with me. Here's what I want. I want you to study God's Word. I want you to wrestle with God's Word. And because I know if you do that, then God will teach you. And if you end up in a different place than me, well, guess what? That's what's been happening for 1,600 years of the church's history. It's okay. We don't all have to agree. What we need to do, though, is respect one another. You see, agreeing about this subject matter of sovereignty and election does not in any way, shape, or form uh, mean that we can't do uh, ministry together, that we can't love people together, that we can't seek to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus together. Okay, in other words, it doesn't divide. Although, uh, if we're honest about it, it's been divisive. But we live in a world right now that's kind of caustic when you don't agree. I, I mean, right? You go on social media, if you don't agree with someone politically or socially, uh, what ends up happening? You know, there's you know, people attack, they get angry, they get, there's a lot of vitriol and, and just, you know, ugly things that are said. And, and if the, the sad thing is, if you do that in the religious world, uh, the same thing happens. And in the name of Jesus, people will attack you for what you believe. And can I just say that I don't think that's Jesus? So if you don't hear anything else that I say today, uh, hear this. Let's respect each other with kindness, whether we agree or not. Because we're all sinners and therefore we're all wrong. And, and we don't have all truth and we're all students on this journey together. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this and, uh, and, and I hope that this, again, encourages you or challenges you to study God's Word. And, and because of the subject matter and because of it, how expansive it is and because we're just kind of open and transparent here at Calvary, uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to invite your questions not while I'm preaching today. Trust me, I don't have time today. I'm going to be flying through this material today. But next week's message is going to be based off of your questions. 
So uh, if you're listening to this uh, and you have a question, write it down. Drop it in the offering box on your way out. There's uh, prayer cards in the, in the seats around you. Or you don't want to do it that way, email it to me, pastorchad at calvarylhc.com. And we're going to base the sermon next week off of your questions that you have over the text and what we're talking about. Don't ask weird questions that aren't related to the text, okay? Because, you know, some of you will be funny, like going, hey, what's the capital of South Dakota? And yes, I do know, it's Pierre. So, uh, <laughs> so let's begin by reading Romans chapter 9. We're going to pick up at verse 6. The Apostle Paul is writing to Christians like us in the church in Rome. And he says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are, ch are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. By the way, if you want to read those accounts that he's referencing in history, Genesis 12 through 28 is Abraham and Isaac. And of course, the Exodus event is referring to Pharaoh. Uh, that's the book of Exodus. You will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Wow, there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, and I've got a few minutes to try and, and make some sense of it. So here's some things that... Uh, that I want to share with you this morning from this text. First one is this. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. That's the easy takeaway. God is in control. God is the creator of this world. He's the designer of this world. He's the controller of this world. It operates according to his plan, his purposes. Now, we say this, and most of us are comfortable saying that God is sovereign, but we're not really comfortable living it out because of our culture. Because most of us in this room are Americans. And we love our freedom of choice, don't we? I mean, we get to choose our presidents. And we get to choose our congressmen and our governors. We get to choose our doctors and our lawyers. We can even choose which plumber we're going to call and take care of the problem. We choose the career we want to go into, the schools we want to go to, the houses we want to live in, the towns we want to live in, and who we want to marry. We are free, and we get to choose, and we love the fact that we get to choose. And some of you right now are thinking, where are we going to eat after this? <laughs> See, that's the biggest choice a lot of us make each week, right? It's, it takes longer to make that than a lot of others. See, we love choice, but God is king. He's not president. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and, and the only sovereign relationship that you and I have is with God. People in history, by and large, had somebody that they related to as sovereign in this world that could tell them what to do and where to go and who to be. But we don't. 
And so we have to wrestle with this relationship with God as sovereign. But when we look at history, we see God's sovereignty because God chose Israel to be his people. God chose Israel to be his people. Look at verses 3 through 5. haven't read those yet. The Apostle Paul says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Now, God chose Israel to be his people. It's a story that you find in the Old Testament. And generally, uh, everyone I talk to is okay with that. You know, we acknowledge that the Israelites were God's chosen people, and God revealed himself to them, and he gave the commandments through them, and he established them as a nation through the Exodus event, and he sent the Messiah into the world to be born as a Jewish baby. Now, in the same way that God chose Israel to be his people, God chooses us to be his people. God chooses us to be his people. Again, verse 8, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So if you're a Jesus follower, then you've been chosen by God. Listen to Scripture. And, and by the way, if, if this is something that you've never heard before or something that you've heard differently, please write down these Scripture references because I'm going to give you a bunch of them. Go back and read them along with Romans chapter 9 again this week. Uh, it may get you thinking about some questions to send me. So here we go. The Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He says, Even as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. The Apostle Peter, writing to the church, again, using, very, uh, using language that mirrored the language for Israel. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then listen to Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. He said, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. John chapter 6, verse 44. Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 65. And Jesus said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Jesus, John 15, verse 16. On the night that he was betrayed, he said to his apostles, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide. See, these passages clearly communicate God's sovereignty, that, that he chooses us, you and me, to be his people. But what does that mean? That means that God initiates the salvation experience. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, God started that experience. God initiated that journey that you're on. He was the first mover. You see, salvation is God's idea, God's action, and God's choice. It's God's idea. Matthew 25, 34, Jesus is telling the parable of judgment, and he says... Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
God's been thinking about your salvation for a long, long time. It was his idea. And then it was God's action. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 and 19. The Apostle Paul says, all this is from God. All this life change we're talking about is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's trespasses against them and entrusting to them the message of reconciliation. God took the action to bring us back to a place of salvation. God is the one who invaded our world in the form of Jesus and then took our sins on the cross while we were still sinners. While we didn't care about him, he cared about us. He did the work for our salvation. And then it was God's choice. Again, Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, even as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. You see, that means that we choose Jesus because he chooses us, because he chose us. We choose Jesus because he chose us. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, hey, wait a minute, I, I chose Jesus. I, I made a decision to follow Jesus. You, in fact, you, pastor, encourage us to follow Jesus, to commit to Jesus, to surrender to Jesus. Uh, are, are you confused? <laughs> Maybe, but uh, let me explain how I understand this process, how I understand it work in my life and, and in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you made a decision to follow Jesus because God initiated that desire in you. God drew you to himself. God woke you up. He called your name. I mean, one day you realize the wonder and beauty of God's grace, and you called out to Jesus, and he changed your life. But Scripture affirms that God acted first to start that process happening. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, As for you, as for us, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Every one of us was dead in our trespasses and sins. So here's the question. What do dead people do? Not counting science fiction, not counting, you know, zombie apocalypse, walking dead stuff, okay? What do dead people actually do? They, they decompose. That's what they do. That's it. They don't make any choices. They, they don't get to decide anything. And see, the reality is we were spiritually dead. We were choosing our forms of destruction, but we were unable to alter our situation until God acted. Continuing in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Jesus. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. God loved you and he made you alive. We were dead. Spiritually, we were dead, and God chose to make us alive, and as we drew our first breath, we chose Jesus. But God went first. Somebody has to go first. It's either us or it's God, and I think Scripture tells us that God went first. And some of you are thinking, well, if that's true, then why do you challenge people to commit? Why do you use the language of decision and invitation? It's really simple, actually. Jesus did. I mean, what was Jesus' invitation to the crowds all the time? Follow me. Follow me. In fact, he said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. It was an invitation language. The apostle Peter used that invitation language. The apostle Paul, I mean, right after this, this passage, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we're going to use that language of invitation. And, and what this means for us is that if you have the desire to be saved, if you want Jesus to save you, guess what? He will. He will absolutely do it. If you trust Jesus, if you call on Jesus, if you place your faith in Jesus, then please have the assurance that you belong to Jesus. That's why for the last couple of weeks we talked about assurance. We talked about security. Hey, we want you to know that this relationship with Jesus, if you have it, is a forever relationship. Because the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. What God starts, God finishes. So I want you to have that assurance. I want you to have that security because you belong to Jesus and, and, and God woke you up. Now our appropriate response to this is gratitude 
and praise. Gratitude and praise. We're receiving mercy when we deserve judgment. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're receiving mercy when you deserve judgment. And even if you don't completely understand how God's sovereignty works, and by the way, none of us do, you know that God loves you and Jesus died for you and you have eternal life because of Jesus. So rejoice, give thanks, celebrate God's goodness to you. Celebrate his life-changing power. Celebrate his love that is in your life. Now, some of you might actually be sitting here going, okay, I know God's mercy, but what about all those other people who don't? I have survivor's guilt. You're not alone. The Apostle Paul had it too. Look at Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul wants his Jewish brothers and sisters to, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. The people that were saying, no, we're rejecting Jesus. We don't believe in this Jesus as Messiah. And Paul goes so far to say, I would go to hell if my nation could be saved. I mean, that's serious. That's serious compassion for people. And so if you're wrestling with this idea, hey, I've got mercy, but I want other people to have mercy, how do I deal with that? Um, be grateful and praise God for his mercy. Now, I want to acknowledge and briefly answer some objections. Uh, I say briefly because I don't have adequate time to answer these uh, this week fully. So next week we'll spend more time. And again, if you've got questions, please write them down on a prayer card, drop them in the offering box, uh, email me. Uh, we, will, we will try to answer your questions, at least to help you process and figure this out. And, and I know I've already heard reports of people saying, I just don't get stuff. That's okay. That's why we're spending two weeks on it. And we'll talk about it. And if you have to, buy me lunch and I'll try to explain more. Uh, <laughs> I'm not opposed to that either. So anyway, I'm going to mention three objections that uh, I have heard in having this conversation with people. Objection number one, okay, but what you described, it's just not fair. It's not fair. Everybody should get an equal opportunity to trust Jesus. Um, look again at the text. Romans 9, 14, Paul says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Uh, by no means. There's not injustice on God's part. Flip the page, verse 19 and 20, and my pages are suddenly stuck together and I can't get there. Uh, he says this, You will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you to answer back to God? Literally, who are you to question God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why did you make me like this? The truth is, if we want fairness, that means that everybody goes to hell. Okay, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. We spent seven chapters in Romans going over and over and over again how hopeless we are because of that rebellious nature that's inside of us, that self-destruction inside of us. Guys, I'm just telling you, fairness says we all deserve hell. That's justice right there. Biblical mercy is that God saves some. He saves some. He wakes some up. He gives life to some. And, and that's what Scripture affirms over and over and over again. Now, uh, whenever I read it, that's what I see. Biblical mercy is that some are saved. Unbiblical mercy is everyone goes to heaven. Now, see, there's some people who want to argue from Scripture that, hey, in the end, everybody gets saved, everybody goes to heaven, and, and a lot of people go, yeah, I kind of like that idea. Let's just let everybody in. And, and, we, and we, it's kind of a good feeling kind of thing. It's not biblical, but it's a good feeling. But the problem is we go, let's let everybody in except, right? Because we've all got exceptions. Let's let everybody in, but not Hitler, right? Or Stalin or Mao. Those guys are bad. Let's not let those guys in. And Osama bin Laden, he doesn't get in. In fact, the terrorists that are cutting people's heads off, they don't get in either. Pedophiles, we don't want them. Keep them out. Oh, and, and by the way, God, how about just leave out my ex too? See, we start drawing lines and we start, you know, excluding people. And pretty soon it's not everybody gets in. It's the people that we want 
that get in. You see, the biblical story is that some are saved. Uh, Fair is justice. Justice is condemnation. Personally, I'll take mercy. And I'm going to rejoice and give thanks for mercy. Second objection, we're all just puppets. If predestination is real, if God is sovereign, it doesn't matter what I do, uh, that's absolutely false. And by the way, this was my objection. When I was arguing against this viewpoint uh, early in my, in my development, I was arguing and saying, no, but I'm not a puppet. I know I have the choice. I know I can rebel against God. I can follow Jesus or not follow Jesus. I just didn't understand how this whole uh, election thing works. You see, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and then God made us spiritually alive. And when he made us spiritually alive, God gave us freedom. If the Son sets you free, Jesus said, you are free indeed. You're free indeed. So we have freedom. As followers of Jesus Christ, we've been set free to follow Jesus or to rebel against Jesus. We've been set free to serve God or to serve self. We've been set free to live free or to submit to slavery again. See, the only choice that God made for you is to wake you up, is to make you alive, is to redeem you from your sins. And now you have life and you have freedom. And what are you going to do with it? Are you going to live for Jesus or are you going to live for yourself? One leads to life. One leads to destruction. Third objection. Why share the gospel? Why share the gospel? If God chooses people, then why would you preach? Why would you serve? Why would you share? Why would you even care? Why in the world is the mission of Calvary to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Simple answer. Jesus. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It's often called the Great Commission. Jesus said to his followers, right, his last words on earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay? Jesus said it. We're followers of who? Jesus. So if Jesus said to do it, then, then we should do it. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And, and so we're going to obey Jesus. By the way, if your theology tells you that you can disobey Jesus, your theology sucks. Okay, and I'll tell that to anybody. If you think you can use the Bible to tell me that you can disobey Jesus, I'll tell you you're reading it completely wrong. So we're going to obey Jesus because we love Jesus. And see, here's the thing. We proclaim simply because Jesus asks us to. God doesn't need us to proclaim the gospel. He invites us to proclaim the gospel. He gives us the privilege of being a part of the greatest work in the history of the world, his kingdom. So I love Jesus, so I want to tell the whole world about his love and about his mercy and his life-changing power. So are you trusting God for your salvation? Have you surrendered to Jesus? Today is he calling your name, and you've heard him for the first time. You see, I, I pray this message challenges you to study God's word and I hope it leads you to rejoice in mercy. But ultimately, here's the single biggest truth for today. It really doesn't matter if you believe that you chose God or you believe that God chose you. What ultimately matters is do you know that you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? You see, I don't care if you think that you're in the kingdom because God decided you were in or you decided you were in. I just want to make sure that you're there with me. That's my heart's desire, and that's my prayer for you, and that's my prayer for us, is that we would continue this mission of life change together because we love Jesus. Let's pray.